thank you so much for being on today. I know you're in Greece, so I won't take up much of your time. And I know that people out there are so excited to hear your story. Uh, just a bit of background on you. You've been on, you've served on 30 boards. You've spoken in about 30 different countries. You've published over 100 articles. You've got almost a million you know, content views online. Not only that, but you've also authored about 10 books and 20 papers, and you've been featured across some of the largest publications from Forbes to Fortune magazine. And really, uh, the reason why we thought it would be really interesting to have you on the show is because you have been at the forefront of the supply chain logistics change. Overseeing supply chain logistics at the World Economic Forum has given you this unique insight into what corporations are looking for, but also the startup community that come, the tech pioneers of the world that come to the forum and are really cutting edge. So with that in mind, I'm really pleased to introduce you. And would you like to say another, maybe a fun uh, element about yourself or something that you want other people to know that they might not know already? I think I'm a very transparent person and uh, um, known for, for being in the supply chain industry for, for decades and uh, with a very broad view on what is happening from Shanghai to, to New York and uh, from uh, probably South Africa to Norway. But, um, and I, my, my passion is, is at that moment um, supply chain innovation, technology, and of course, in, in that bucket falls automation. And uh, I'm not only interested in what the technologies are, but how they convert into applications, into solutions, and into value uh, for economy and society. That is fantastic. Well, I think your, the audience would probably have a few questions to ask you, given your unique insight into the industry. So let's start off, and we want to keep this very snappy, and we want to make sure you have uh, essentially time to answer these questions. So I want to start off very high level. Uh, in particular, there's this current, um, I would say, climate, which we're living in, this COVID world, and we're seeing quite a lot of automation and a push for automation within the supply chain industry. Uh, and of course, the leading countries in the world are uh, the US, China, Korea, Japan, Germany. What we wanted to know is which economy seems to be pushing the most and which economy will be incentivized to push most for automation within the supply chain. First, I think that uh, there are two, two economies, two countries that are pushing very hard on the technology and automation front. And uh, this is the well-known US effort to be uh, top notch and uh, the leading innovator in the world. And then there's China, China that has managed in an incredibly short time um, the, to catch up with uh, a lot of a lot of technological development. And this was part of the transformation of the Chinese economy. Incentives, I think, are spread equally across the world. Every nation, whether it is France and Germany, whether it's Denmark, uh, whether it is Japan, never to forget, and, and uh, Korea, they all have an in incentive to innovate. But the countries I mentioned are all in the, let's say, upper, upper third of the world innovators. That means the more advanced you are, the more you are incentivized to, to drive harder to keep your position. Mm -hmm. So we, we've spoken about economies. Now let's talk about corporations. The corporations in these economies, they are in this political climate. Are they going to have, uh, I mean, tax benefits to automate? I know this is quite a controversial question, but are they going to be incentivized to suddenly spend uh, 
5 million in the next you know, quarter just on automation. Can you give us a bit of an idea quantitatively how much investment is going into automation within the supply chain for the large corporations out there? I think that on the um, on the asset automation numbers will not uh, differ that much tomorrow from what they were yesterday. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, they we had seen um, a boom in warehouse automation. I, I think that will continue uh, with autonomous. We have to see whether that kicks in in five years or in ten years. There are parts which which I I see that could play a role like uh, drone deliveries, which is also a process of automation. Um, but where the big, big push is at that point is on the more digital side, on the process side. It's about the platform economy. It's about uh, robotics process automation. It's about uh, back offices. So it's about the routine jobs of, uh, in fact, the white color people where the, the investments are and they pay off very quickly. Um, I think that robotics process automation is the, the hidden hero mm -hmm. of the, the recent development. Yeah, and in most recent times, there's a push towards health and safety regulation, given the current climate. And so this push towards uh, essentially automating your warehouse seems to be the main agenda for most large companies and especially those that own their manufacturing hubs. I guess my question to you is, let's focus on, on the US for one second, uh, because there's this current agenda to bring onshore, essentially bring all the manufacturing back home. My question is, to what extent do a lot of these large corporations own their own manufacturing hubs and their distribution centers? That's a good question. Um, and uh, we talk a lot about resilience nowadays. So people are of the opinion that the world economy is too dependent on China. And to a certain extent, that's, that's understandable although maybe not, not totally true, but understandable because the dependency on the China economy has risen over the last 10 years. But if we move now everything back to the US and to Europe, we create the same dependency, the same vulnerability. If Europe or the US get a hit or a disruptive effect, then we may have wished to leave something in China. So even from a conceptual point of view, I, I don't believe that that, that will happen. We, we need a, a diverse world. We need to, to put uh, factories, if possible, close to the market. But it's not always possible. We have, in, we have industries like electronics where we have uh, products or components that are produced only in two or three places in the world. And one place might be the US and one place might be China. And the reason why this is the case is because the today's economy is a knowledge economy, is, is driven by very specific knowledge and capabilities. If we look into a TV, um, and or a radio or whatever electronics um, device we have, which was produced in the 60s and one in the 80s and one today, we will see exactly that trends, trend towards sophistication. And that means that we have factories which cost billions of dollars, three, five, six billion of dollars, and uh, the centers of knowledge for specific components. And moving these is very, very hard because we have to have them where the talent is. And that's, and that's also a, a reality. A reality is that we are not uh, having the same level of expertise in all countries. We have clearly hubs of certain capabilities. Mexico is a hub for automotive and Thailand is a hub for uh, computer hard disks. 
And we know that Vietnam became a hub for mobile phones, and that has a reason. That you're absolutely you've hit the nail on the head. There's a great statistic uh, by Element AI. They say there's 22,000 PhDs that can essentially be either the CTOs or fulfill all these very technical roles within the, the automation industry. And those people are probably swamped up by or taken by the Googles and the Facebooks of the world. So what about everyone else? The skills in this industry are massively lacking. So do you foresee a lot of education in coming forward and more training so that the skills can be distributed uh, to many people, especially in this world where we can now learn online? What are your thoughts there? I think that that question points to a conversation uh, Barack Obama had in Silicon Valley a few years back where he met the likes of Steve Jobs. And the, the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs told him that if he wants to bring back manufacturing to the United States, it's about education. Mm -hmm. And I think you're hitting here a very important um, point because in the whole debate of re relocation, I haven't heard that much about building the capabilities, training the people, investing in education. And in fact, that's what we need. Mm -hmm. I think the times where factory work was about low skill manual work are gone. Today's factory needs skilled workers. Mm -hmm. And that's where the difference comes from. It's not about the cost of labor, it's the opposite. It's about the quality of labor. And that's where a lot of countries fall short. And that's where China has seen its opportunity. We've had this discussion many times, Wolfgang, in the years I've known you. And one of the key misconceptions that you've highlighted is that actually there's a shortage of labor in manufacturing facilities. And can you just Go deeper into that and also what do you mean by quality within these manufacturing hubs today? Yeah, we, we need to understand when we talk about automation that we want to automate something which is very complex. And that can be proven by the fact that today about 350 million people work in factories. If it were that easy, to replace them all by robots, that had already happened for a long time. So we, we face the situation that the, the work we have to do, the problem solving, right? The quick reaction, the holistic thinking about what, what is happening here cannot be done by robots. Mm -hmm. We have seen that fully automated sites very often fail. And this is exactly because of that reason. You need humans. And we, don't, we should not talk about automation. We should talk about enhancement, support, collaboration between humans and machines. And, and machines are very, very important. They help us. They help us to be more productive, to have a safer workplace, but humans have their place there. I have, I would say one more question that I think only you will know um, and have a unique insight into you. So in Davos 2021, the event for the global enterprises of the world, will we see more industrial, uh, more of a discussion around industrial automation in 2021? And if so, what do you think will be the focus and the key themes that everyone should be thinking about now up till Davos 2021? I believe that we will have a, a strong discussion, a broad discussion, an intense discussion about automation. We have, we have seen this now. The topic of automation uh, became more popular. Robots don't get infected and uh, it is also attractive to think that robots may help us 
to continue manufacturing at the same productivity levels during times of a pandemic. And, and this thinking will definitely drive the discussion in Davos. Uh, but I come back to what I said before, we need to be realistic about what, what we can automate. We cannot automate uh, all industrial jobs. Mm -hmm. But um, what uh, I expect from Davos in terms of um, outcomes is maybe exactly this. Mm -hmm. the, the, again, reminder that our economy is not only about machines. The economy is about us, for us, with us, because it's not that we all will be happy if we just get all the products we need produced by machines. We need still our own identity and we need to have our role in society and our profession, our activity is a big part of that. And I hope that that will be one of the outcomes in Davos 2021. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. And do you have any closing remarks for the, the folks? Can you tell us a little, I would say, uh, what you're looking forward to in, uh, in the coming months in terms of the industry, but also the change and just a last bit of motivation for everyone who's working hard in the manufacturing hubs, those who are in, you know, driving e-commerce and change. Any words of wisdom? I don't know whether I have a word of wisdom, <laughs> but um, clearly, clearly a word of motivation. Uh, I can share that uh, I was amazed and impressed by the resilience of the supply chain. I, I'm again and again saying and, and making the point that our supply chains are not broken. Mm -hmm. Our supply chains haven't disappointed us. Consider what we have done to the supply chain ecosystem. We have rejected airplanes. We have rejected ships. Mm -hmm. We have closed train tra tracks. We have not developed a standard for essential workforce in the space of logistics and transport. We had hundreds of thousands of seafarers stuck at home and on the boats. And nevertheless, and even despite the toilet paper discussion, I think we, we were not suffering that much from tremendous shortages. So that was a, a great, great achievement. And a, a warning I have also to share, which is to wait for the new normal. I think what we need to accept is that COVID is the new normal. So we live with pandemics. It's not something new anyway, but I believe a lot of people who have thought that the virus would go away somewhere in the first half have to realize we don't know how long we have to live with this. And therefore, we have to start shifting our focus, not waiting and improvising to manage this as an exceptional time. But we need to accept COVID-19 as the new normal and prepare for operating with it. And people who know my speeches, I, I don't believe that we should shut down countries, mm -hmm. that we should close borders. We need to learn how to intelligently work with this situation and during these times. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. What an incredible time to be in the industry and so grateful for your time today. Enjoy the rest of your stay in Greece and I'm sure we'll have you back on here in this new normal world. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks for the invitation, Tiki.